Uh, so we are now going to turn to our expert here on the panel, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, uh, Director General of the National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi, a position he took up after a four decade distinguished career in the Indian Navy. And over to you, um, Pradeep, if I may. Um, well, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, let me uh, quickly share my screen and my presentation. I'm hoping that you can now see it and you can hear me clearly. Um, yeah, so let me at the outset express my gratitude to all the three uh, organizations who's, uh, who managed to put this fabulous event together. Uh, as witnessed the wonderful experience we've had over the last couple of days. I myself, I intend to uh, almost immediately cascade from the Indo-Pacific uh, concept, which we've been uh, listening to in various uh, nuances over the last couple of days, and uh, directly move to some possible strategies to address security challenges within the Indo-Pacific and to provide you with what I think might be an Indian uh, perspective, as well as an uh, uh, ASEAN-centric one. So uh, as far as India is concerned, in common with most people, we are desired end state, of course, is the economic material and societal well-being of the people of India. And for this, in the maritime domain, uh, India's overarching statement of policy is not actually our East, uh, look East policy, but uh, the maritime policy is encapsulated by SAGAR, which is the acronym for uh, security and growth for all in the region. And as this diagram uh, indicates on your screen, this is India's uh, diplomatic, military, and economic outreach throughout the region. And uh, India is determined to be a player uh, in this particular region. And what are then uh, our interests? And I think this is a common area. Uh, we have uh, holistic maritime security, and I cannot uh, emphasize adequately enough uh, the importance of the adjective holistic uh, maritime security, which is uh, really a freedom from threats arising in the sea or through the sea or from the sea. And this tabulation uh, shows how common these are across the entire Indo-Pacific. And uh, in some cases, uh, ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN needs uh, to very much look at its, uh, re-look at its uh, security fabric. So we have these threats, whether they are man-made, uh, they are traditional, they are non-traditional, they are natural, they are combinations, classic examples of which are climate change and the degradation of ABNJ, BBNJ, et cetera. But if you look at uh, ASEAN and how it is placed, uh, it long tended to concentrate solely upon the non-traditional uh, issues uh, ranging from safety at sea, maritime pollution, maritime crime, the Sulu and Sulawesi Sea come to mind when we talk about maritime crime, armed robbery, if not outright piracy, hijacking, smuggling. Uh, we've spoken about human trafficking in many uh, small points with the Rohingya problem and IUU fishing, which threatens uh, food security, not only regionally, but also globally. And yet ASEAN needs to uh, refocus on things that they never thought would actually happen to them, which is geopolitical constriction and the very real probability possibility of state on state conflict out breaking out in their region. So uh, I think that uh, Dr. Shankari uh, Sundararaman in the morning spoke rather well about the objectives that India has. I just wanted to highlight five. I understand that they're difficult to read in this. So let me uh, expand that for you. And they're really protection from sea-based threats arising from a disrespect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. There is uh, stability, peace, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, especially in South Asia. Creation, development, and sustenance of a blue economy that is resilient against adverse maritime effects of climate change. The preservation, promotion, uh, and uh, pursuit and protection of, of offshore infrastructure and maritime resources and the promotion, the protection, and the safety of regional shipping lanes and the ports that constitute the nodes of maritime trade so as to support what we've spoken about for the last two days about uh, diversification or decoupling of uh, resilient uh, supply chains. So that brings me directly to our strategies. And I want to be clear that for India, uh, the Indo-Pacific is not in and of itself a strategy, but it is rather a strategic geography 
within which India pursues several uh, hopefully inclusive, cooperative and collaborative, and certainly occasionally competitive strategies of our own. Our uh, engagement in the, uh, the Indo-Pacific region has been uh, outlined sufficiently. I won't, uh, I won't elaborate upon it, but I do want to say that it is designed to promote dialogue, international law, and a democratic and rules-based international order in which all nations, large and small, thrive as equal and sovereign. And that brings us to what India wants to do at the regional level. We believe very firmly in Zoltan Merce's famous comment that money is a coward. Money doesn't go where there is turbulence and risk. And all of us need the money to keep our economies running. And therefore we are all driven commonly, and so is India, to contribute towards regional maritime stability. Like every other country, India and all the countries to whom I speak, uh, our, their strategic policy is invariably informed by an ongoing assessment of present and future risk in the region, where risk is, of course, the probability of the occurrence of an event, for example, the outbreak of hostilities, and the acceptability of resultant loss should that event occur. Now, insofar as India is concerned, we have seven major regional threats one for each day of the week. And you can see that China figures somewhat disconcertingly frequently in far too many of them. So our response to this is really that of constructive engagement, which is the central pillar from which our strategy flows. Here, we have to answer an important question. What should we do? I keep hearing about resource strapped nations. Should we remember like mom and dad and everybody told us to cut our coat according to our cloth or should we weave our cloth according to the court that we want? In that case, I want to, be, uh, want to remind you of the difference between capacity and capability, uh, something that we use interchangeably to our great peril. Uh, capacity, you don't have a patrol boat, I give you a patrol boat, I've doubled your capacity. But do you know how to operate it? Do you have a uh, operational maintenance cycle? Do you have a life cycle costing? You've got a training infrastructure, you've got a legal framework, yes, 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 yes. Wow, you have capability. No, 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 and no, you only have a liability. So the way that we have uh, tried to structure this is to say that we would like to approach the region through the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. And it is uh, a web of seven uh, spokes, which, uh, which are well familiar to all of you. So there's no need for me to dwell on this, but I do want to make one, uh, Critic, a criticism of the manner in which it has been constructed. The IPOI has been conceptualized as a set of seven pillars, thereby falsely imagining that some lead nation can concentrate upon a single pillar. In actual fact, any uh, given country attempting to lead in a given pillar uh, will have no option but to adopt and incorporate several of the other pillars as well. So we've got Australia taking the lead for uh, marine ecology, wonderful but it must necessarily draw from the science, technology, and academic cooperation pillar, the trade, connectivity, and maritime transport pillar. And if you want to think, think uh, ballast water management, think uh, carbon sulfide emissions, et cetera, it must draw from the maritime resources pillar and so on. In the same way, if India says, and India has said, that we would like to take the lead for maritime security, then it too must draw from the science, technology, and academic cooperation pillar, the trade connectivity and maritime transport pillar, the marine ecology pillar. Well, think about the correlation between uh, Noctiluca, Scintillant, luminescent blooms, algae blooms, and submarine and anti-submarine operations. It isn't uh, part of the mainstream dialogue, but it should be. Uh, the marine resources pillar, capacity building, resource sharing, and so on. Let me then turn to the, uh, to the elephant in the room, as always, and talk about China, not uh, necessarily as an adversary, but most certainly as a risk factor. The fundamental question with dealing with China is this, if we were to be nicer to China, will China be nicer to us? And the answer really lies in, the, in, 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 in referring to perhaps the Game of Thrones where China is Queen Cersei. Queen Cersei's job is to knock her, your head off. If you're a supplicant, your job is to supplicate. So, in actual fact, past behavior is the only reliable bellwether for future behavior. There is no other way. And if you look at the ASEAN obsession 
with the with the DOC and COC, I want to point out that China has publicly repeatedly signed and ratified and publicly committed to so many past documents, MMCA, the Qs, the what 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 makes us think that just because we present China with this new candy, China's going to say, wonderful, thank you so much. So any it's an, an insistence upon any additional signed commitment for a narrower sub-region specific commitment of good behavior, I'm afraid is unlikely to be more than chasing a chimera. And it runs the very real risk of confusing activity of which there's plenty with accomplishment of which there is little. With that, I turn to my last slides, and that is that we need a strategic framework. Every regional security structure must have at least three subordinate structures or layers, a conceptual structure, a political structure, and an executive structure, because at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, when academia is finished and think tanks are finished and policy wonks have done their stuff, finally, somebody has to go to sea. And that somebody has to be navies or coast guards or maritime security agencies. So if we imagine the conceptual structure, I think should be in fact, Sagar and its wider regional emphasis on the IPOI. Incidentally, there are nine clear linkages of commonality between the IPOI and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, uh, which has been the subject of an earlier discussion. Political structure, there's been much, much disparaging of the ARF, but I would rather think precisely because of its inclusivity, the ARF ought to be the political structure here. Yeah. And uh, insofar as the executive structure is concerned, there is no doubt whatsoever that a seamless integration between the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and the Western Pacific Naval Symposium is an absolute imperative, particularly given the fact that nine out of the countries are common to both these executive constructs. With that, I will stop and hope that breathless run through uh, has satisfied uh, the moderator's uh, strict instructions in yeah. terms of, thank you very much. Uh, a dream panelist, I think I'd say, and uh, complete with those intriguing uh, little diagrams. Uh, so hopefully we'll come back into the subset, more substance on those. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Pradeep. And